Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you. We are in the book of Galatians this morning. We're continuing our studies in it. And our text this morning <clears throat> is Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. But before I read the text, I have uh, an announcement from the elders for all of you. And now that, uh, as Seth has mentioned, COVID restrictions are being lifted and things seem to be returning to normal. Some of you have asked when we will resume the evening meeting. Well, we're planning to do that in two weeks, only with a change in schedule. Instead of meeting in the evening, we will meet in the morning following the Ministry of the Word service, this service. Uh, so we will not only observe the Lord's Supper, but we will do all that we do in the evening meeting. We will sing hymns, we'll have men speak and teach and pray. It will be 45 minutes in length, but to fit all of that in, there will be a change uh, in schedule of the times of our classes. So Sunday school will be from 9.30 to 10.15. The ministry of the Word will be from 10.30 to 11.30, and then there'll be a 10-minute break. Then the meeting will begin, and it will end at 12.30. The elders have given a lot of thought to this over the past few months. COVID has changed things. Uh, for one thing, many of you have gotten used to taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday morning, which is good. But also older members have difficulty coming at night. That's particularly true in the, in the uh, wintertime. Young families seem to always have difficulty with uh, children's bedtime. And some just have difficulty for one reason or other, another coming in the evening. Um, these have always been problems, but also we think this will give you the opportunity to experience the full ministry of the church together as the body of Christ and to grow in grace from it. That's our object. We try to follow the pattern of the early church. So to prepare for this change, next week... I'm going to take a break from the book of Galatians and give a lesson on how the early church met and the reasons that it met as it did, mainly from the book of Acts, but also from 1 Corinthians. Let me just say this, change is never easy. It's not easy for me, but this is our plan at this time, and, and so we want to prepare you for it. So this begins in two weeks, begins June 13th, next week, a lesson on the church. But this week we're in Galatians, and um, we're in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Paul has been explaining the law, why the law, and the Christian's relationship to it. And that's what he continues with. In our text, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 4, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we while we were children, were held, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. 
Let's bow in a word of prayer. I've taken my title from Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. He titled the first chapter, A Slave Among Slaves, and began, I was born a slave. I would never write an autobiography, but if I were to write one, I couldn't begin it any better than that. Because that was true of me. That's true of all of us. I was born a slave, a slave among slaves, but Jesus Christ freed me. That is the reason he came into the world, and that is the lesson of our text, Galatians 4, 1 through 7. He brought us up from slavery. The passage divides into two parts. In verses 1 through 3, Paul describes our life under the law as slavery. In verses 4 through 7, he describes our life in Christ as freedom. John Stott summarized Paul's thought as me and meaning as, Once we were slaves, now we are sons. How then can we turn back to the old slavery? Well, Paul's answer is, of course, we cannot. That's what he has been arguing against doing. So he begins the chapter by describing our life of slavery under the law. He describes the law as a guardian, an idea that he took from the wealthy Roman households of his day where a child was placed under guardianship. This is different from the pedagogue that he spoke of in the previous passage. The guardian had control over the boy's property and finances until he was old enough to make his own decisions. But until then, he was no better than a slave. That's what Paul says. Even though the child is the heir and is the owner of everything, still, while he is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave. He was under the control of his handlers. And that was only temporary until the date set by the father, as Paul says. Then, when he reached a certain age, the age that the father had determined and had stipulated in his will, then the guardian's control ended. The child assumed authority and was no longer a slave. So also we, Paul wrote in verse 3, the experience of a Roman child and a Christian are similar because we were all under the guardianship and control of the law. We were like children, Paul says, held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. And that's what the law was. The elemental things, the basic things. It's an expression that means things placed side by side in a row. It's used of the letters of the alphabet in a row, like the ABCs or the alpha, beta, gammas. And then, because the learning of the ABCs is the, the, the first lesson of an education, the expression came to mean the rudiments, the first principles, the basics. Here they are, the basic religious principles, the basic rules of morality, the Ten Commandments, or the rules Gentiles had. Every man has a conscience, and from that, men have developed uh, thing, uh, ideas of right and wrong. They have within them that principle of right and wrong. The Law of Moses defined those rules that everyone has more precisely, but men have always had basic rules and uh, truths that they held which are proper, which are right. But the problem is, as with, with the law and with the Jews, also with the Gentiles, they thought they could have salvation by keeping to those principles, those elementary, elemental things of the world. And of course, that always fails. 
Paul's point is it's failed for the Jewish people. This is not the way salvation is achieved, but it's true uh, that it fails for the Gentile as well. The law cannot save us, and it cannot save us not because the law is at fault or because the law has anything inherently wrong with it. It cannot save us because we cannot keep it. And the law doesn't give the power to do that. But that, that failure should cause a person to look beyond himself or herself to the one who can save. And that's what law, that Paul has been teaching as the purpose of the law. That's how the law prepared people for the coming of Christ. That was its function. It taught us right from wrong. It taught us the basics and taught us that we cannot do the right. We don't have the ability to do that. God set a date for the law's control to end. In verse 4, Paul refers to that date as the fullness of the time. When that, the, the period of bondage would end, when the law had served the purpose for which God gave it, and Christ would then come. And God had not only predetermined the date for that, but also providentially prepared the world for it, both spiritually and logistically. The age came to a, a fullness when everything in the world, everything, the circumstances were right for everything that would unfold. By the first century, there was great expectation for the coming of the Messiah among the Jews. And in the Roman world, there was great dissatisfaction among the Gentiles. The old religions were dying. The myths and gods had lost their hold on the people. The old philosophies were empty and powerless and moral conditions were low. So men's hearts had been prepared for the Lord's coming. But the world had also been prepared politically and materially for his coming and the spread of the gospel. It was the age of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and that extended over the whole of the, the known world, over the empire, and produced a time of political and social order and economic stability. Wherever the Roman legions went, they built roads that connected all of the major cities and regions of the empire. And all the roads led to Rome, the capital of the world. Because of the, the earlier conquests of Alexander the Great, the world was speaking Greek. They spoke Latin, they spoke Aramaic, they spoke Scythian and other languages, but they all spoke Greek as well. It was the lingua franca, franca of the day. So travel was possible on Roman roads and communication was easy with a common language. In fact, Greek was a language particularly suited to the teaching of the New Testament. It is an exact language, and it's more suitable for expressing abstract thought, theological thought, philosophical thought. Also due to the Jewish diaspora, the uh, forced relocation of Jews, as well as their, their movement due to economic opportunity, Jews had settled abroad. They had settled across the, the empire and beyond. They were in the east, they were around the Mediterranean, they were to the west, and so as a result of, of that, uh, they'd established synagogues throughout the world. And these provided places for Christian missionaries to reach both Jews and Gentiles with the gospel and establish churches with new converts. Roman laws protected the rights of Roman citizens, allowing churches to grow, and Roman soldiers protected the peace, allowing the gospel to spread more freely. Christ's birth at Bethlehem then was not an accident of history. It happened in the fullness of the time, at God's appointed time. He is sovereign over the ages and directs history. And when the world had been prepared and the appointed time had come, 
Paul writes, he sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now that's a carefully worded statement that is full of meaning. Paul didn't say, in the fullness of time Christ was born. But sent forth, literally sent out. It has the idea uh, that he was sent out from heaven. He was sent out from God. He was sent out on a mission. It's a statement that indicates Christ's preexistence. What is particularly important is he sent forth his son. Not an angel, but a son. And he was already a son when he sent him, suggesting that he is eternally God's son. He was with God. He was God. And there are many texts that support that. It suggests that, well, that's the, the prologue to the Gospel of John that I alluded to. But there are others as well. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Paul wrote that he is our great God and Savior. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. I could list many texts that support the deity of Christ. He left the heavenly glory that he enjoyed with the Father for all eternity to go on the Father's mission into this world, and he did it by being born of a woman, by becoming a man, by becoming one of us, through the mysterious conception in the womb of the virgin, which in the Gospel of Luke is simply described as the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. But through that mysterious, miraculous conception, the Lord assumed a human nature which He derived from Mary so that He became the unique person, the unique God-man. John simply says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became a genuine man, flesh and blood. And Paul's emphasis here is on that. It's on his true humanity. Through a, a miraculous conception, as I said, but a natural birth, he entered the world, as all men do, of a woman. In his case, a Jewish woman into a Jewish nation, and so under the Jewish law. And he submitted to it completely. He kept the law perfectly, and in so doing, he proved that he is sinless and he is qualified to carry out the mission on which he was sent. It was a mission of salvation and is described in verse 5 with two goals. First, to redeem, and secondly, to adopt. That he might redeem, Paul says, those who were under the law. Now that's a hard place to be, under the law. Do this and live, is what the law says. But that is impossible. Peter spoke of the law as a yoke that neither they nor their fathers could bear. It's a heavy yoke. It was given amid thunder and lightning. It terrified Israel when it was given. The mountain, Mount Sinai, smoked and shook. But we've been freed from its strict regulations over daily life, from diet to clothing, to the calendar. It regulated every aspect of daily life. Christ has redeemed us from that. Paul used this word redeemed earlier in chapter 3 and verse 13 where he said that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And that's the idea here. We've all broken God's law. Whether Jew or Gentile, we have all sinned against the elemental things of the world, whether it's the law of Moses or just the law that, that, that Gentiles have, have arranged through their conscience, through their knowledge of right and wrong, their sense of ought, which is there by virtue of the fact that we're all born 
in the image of God. It's a wrecked image because of the fall, but nevertheless, the rudiments of it are there. There's enough there for us to know right from wrong. We've all sinned against that, whether it's the, the codified law of Moses or what people just have a sense for their own code, what's right and wrong. It's been violated. All men have violated the principles and proven themselves to be sinners. As a, re a result of that, all men stand condemned. They stand under a curse. But Christ came to redeem us from that, which means He came to set us free by paying a price. The word Paul uses here is an intensive form of the word. It means to buy out of. And that's the idea of redemption. It was a, a commercial term that was used of buying things, and often it was used of buying a slave. Slave markets were common in Roman cities. There were something like 60 million slaves in the empire. So it's very common for a person to, to go into a slave market and buy a slave either for himself or in order to set one free. Christ came to buy us out of the slave market of sin and set us free. That was the only way that we could have freedom. As Paul pointed out in chapter 2, verse 21, if there had been any other way to obtain freedom, to obtain salvation, it would have been the way that we would have done it. If there was any other way that it could have been achieved to free ourselves, then he says Christ died needlessly. Well, Christ couldn't die needlessly. So the fact that he died, that he was crucified, proved that we needed that for our salvation, that we, we needed the cross, that there was no other way possible for salvation except through the death of the God-man. We could not save ourselves. We were slaves of sin. We were helpless. We were held captive by sin. We were held under the curse of of the law. But Christ redeemed us. He bought our freedom by buying us out of slavery and for Himself, bringing us out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of light and setting us free. And again, He did that by dying for us. That was the price that was paid for our freedom. He became a curse for us, as Paul puts it in chapter 3. He suffered the penalty of the law so that we would escape that penalty. Now that is an immeasurable blessing. To be set free from, from a life of slavery to sin and death, a dismal, degrading, dark existence, to be freed from the curse of the law, from the condemnation of the law. If that were all that Christ did, that would have been enough. But that's not all that He did. He also brought us out of slavery that we might receive the adoption as sons. God sent His Son into the slave market of the world to set us free, he sent him into the orphanage of the world to adopt us as his sons. Adoption was not a Jewish institution. It was a Greek and Roman practice in which a, a, wealthy, a wealthy childless man might take into his family a slave boy who, by adoption, ceased being a slave and became a son and heir. Lou Wallace drew on that custom for his book, Ben-Hur. I read the abridged edition back when I think it was in the seventh grade, so that size is opposed to that. Uh, some of you may have read it. You've probably all seen the movie, but in it, the hero, Judah Ben-Hur, a Jewish prince, suffered a series of misfortunes. He was arrested and he was sent to the Roman galleys. He spent years chained to an oar. His future was dismal, one of bondage, hard labor, and death. And then a, a, a great 
in a great sea battle, his fortunes changed. His ship was sunk, but he escaped, and, he, and in his escape he saved the life of the admiral of the fleet. In gratitude, the admiral adopts him as his son, and Judah Ben-Hur rises to a position of wealth, power, and authority. Now that is only a very, very pale illustration of our sonship. We did nothing heroic to gain it. Everything was done for us. We were redeemed, bought on the cross, and born again by the Holy Spirit from beginning to end, from eternity to eternity. It is all a gift. We were rescued. So we, we sing about that in Charles Wesley's great hymn that Chris quoted it this morning in the Sunday school class. And can it be that I should gain? It's a great hymn. I think Dr. Johnson had said one time that was his favorite hymn. Even though it was Wesley's great hymn, it was a great one as all his hymns were. This is Charles Wesley's hymn. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. We followed, not simply as freed men and women, but as sons and daughters of God, who as our Father has given us all of the rights and privileges of His family. We're like that Roman boy who, when he reached manhood, took off the, the child's tunic or toga with its crimson border and put on the long white robe, the toga of manhood. He was accepted as a man in the family. He took his place at the family councils, enjoyed his freedom and, and privileges and undertook the responsibilities of the family. Now that is what every believer in Christ has experienced. Through faith in Christ, we have been delivered from bondage, made sons of God, and entered into the privileges and blessings of sonship and the responsibilities of it. There's no position of greater prestige than that and no position of greater security than that. We are sons of God. We are all sons of God as believers in Christ, male and female. We have the privileges and power, real power, that comes with faith in Christ being adopted into God's family and nothing can change that. Well, people worry about that. They per worry that it can change, that if we sin, we may fall out of His favor, fall away from God and perish. It's impossible. Whose son or daughter hasn't sinned? Did you cast them off? Did you disown them? Of course not. Do you think you are more loving of your children than God is of His? He who sacrificed His own eternal, natural Son for you, who paid that price to gain your freedom and your sonship and your part in His family, that He would then cast you off? He can't do that. The calling and the love of God is irrevocable. That's Romans 11, verse 29. We have been bought. We have been called. We have been made sons and daughters of God. That is our position. That is our spiritual status. It is greater than that of the angels, and it is forever. But how do we know that we have it? That's a great blessing, and we could spend much more time exploring that, the greatness of it. But how do we know we have it? What's the assurance that we have it? We know, first of all, because God's Word said it. Chapter 3, verse 26 of Galatians, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That, that is the external witness to our status as sons. 
Those who have believed and all who have believed are sons of God without exception. We can rest confidently in our salvation based upon the witness of Scripture. It is our authority. It is God's Word. It is true. It is reliable. It is inerrant. It's the foundation of knowing. But there's a second witness, an internal witness, just as real, just as objective as Scripture, but within, and that is the Holy Spirit. God sent Him on a mission into our hearts where He bears witness to our adoption and sonship. That's what, what Paul says in verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's because we are sons that He comes. No other qualification is needed. We don't need to have some second blessing in order to receive the Holy Spirit. We don't need to, to strive for some experience or speaking in tongues or being baptized or more to the point of this book, being circumcised to have the Spirit. Sonship is all that's required and we have that through faith alone. At the moment of faith, the believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. When you believe, you're sealed permanently until the day of redemption, as Paul goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 4. Now Paul calls the Holy Spirit, as you notice, the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Christ. The reason for that is because He proceeds from the Son and the Father both and is sent forth by them into this world and into our hearts. And as sent by both, he testifies specifically to Christ. You see that in John chapter 15, verse 26. That's his ministry. It's to, it's to witness to Christ and, and to promote the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's the spirit of his son, of God's son. So his ministry is to confirm the truth about Christ and do so in our hearts and confirm in the hearts of believers that we are God's Son, that we belong to God. So in verses 5 and 6, Paul brings together the, the, the three distinct yet identical persons of the Trinity to show that salvation is a work of all three, that salvation is of the Lord. God the Father sent the Son into the world to die for us, and the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, and coming into our hearts, He cries, Abba, Father. Now in Romans 8, verse 15, Paul describes us as the ones who cry, Abba. But we do that as a result of the Spirit's ministry within us, as a result of the Spirit giving the assurance that we are sons and daughters of God, that we are all sons of God. He enables us to cry out in that way. This word Abba is a, a term of affection. It is the Aramaic word for father, and it's, it's very similar to our word Papa or, or Daddy. J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase, paraphrase, put it, Father, dear Father. It's a very personal way of addressing God, expressing affection, expressing confidence and intimacy. But it also has a significant connection with Christ because this was the same expression that he used in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's recorded in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. He was in great agony. And he addressed his father as Abba. It was the greatest crisis of his life. When he needed his father most, he leaned on him hardest. He called him Abba. And what Paul is saying here is that the Holy Spirit gives us the assurance that we have the same 
closeness to God that Jesus Christ had. The very same. He is our Abba too. What a privilege, what a blessing that is. No servant could ever say father to his master. But we are sons, not slaves. We have a close, intimate relationship with God Almighty. Understanding that, we should draw near to Him with the same confidence and affection that Christ did. We cannot be closer to God the Father than that. So do you think that the law could add anything to your relationship with God that faith has not already obtained? Of course not. Through faith, you are sons of God. Male and female, you are sons of God with all of the rights and the privileges of sonship. And the Holy Spirit enables us to, to live as sons, to live in those privileges and those responsibilities. He not only gives us the assurance of our salvation, He gives us love and He gives us the desire to obey and the ability to walk obediently. Paul speaks of this later when he speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit and what He produces in us. Well, now in verse 7, Paul concludes with a, a summary of what he has said. Therefore, he says, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. An historical shift has occurred. There's been a change in the ages. The fullness of the time came. The, the, the law's rule has ended, and believers in Christ are now sons and daughters. As F.F. F. Bruce wrote, we have freedom and the power to use it responsibly. We have real life-changing power. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We have a new nature. We have a new heart that is, as Spurgeon said, a law unto itself. That, that keeps the regenerate from departing from the Lord and gives us a desire to obey, to walk by the Spirit. Well, that's our present situation. But our future is even greater. Because we are sons, we are heirs. What can we say about that? Well, we can only begin to scratch the surface of our inheritance. We know it involves absolute purity and unlimited joy and happiness. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, we read of an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. It is pure, it is permanent, it is eternal, and it awaits us. That's where life is heading for the believer in Jesus Christ. Not oblivion, not the dark shadows of some unknown existence, but a kingdom of light and glory. It awaits us. Glory beyond description. That, Paul indicates that in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, where he wrote, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In other words, we can't even begin to imagine how glorious it is. But again, it's there for us. The law didn't gain that for us. And it can't add to what we have. What we have is ours because of Christ. It's all of grace. It is all ours, as Paul said, through God. So all the glory goes to Him. Because He sent His Son, Christ came and bought us, and in so doing, brought freedom to us, real freedom, the greatest freedom, true freedom, spiritual freedom. He has given us new life and new ability through the Holy Spirit to live responsibly and obediently in that freedom and live the best life. Live as God has created us to live. 
So may we live that life. May we appreciate all the blessings that Christ has gained for us. And it's as we, we grow in our understanding of those blessings and our understanding of what it cost Him, what it cost Christ to gain them for us, as we reflect on that and understand that, we grow in our appreciation and we increase in our resolve to live that life. Booker T. Washington wrote that the first time he knew he was a slave was one morning when his, he saw his mother on her knees praying that she and her children might be free. Well, we could say it took the blood of over half a million Americans, 750,000, to, to free him and bring him up from slavery. It took more than that to free us. It took the sacred blood of the God-man, of the Son of God, to gain our freedom. Are you in Him? You are not in Him if you have not believed in Christ as your God and Savior. You're still a slave, living in bondage to sin under the whippings of the law, and judgment is coming. It is coming. Escape to Christ, flee to Him. His sacrifice swipes away all our sins. It removes all our guilt. It's sufficient for all our sins and an infinite number of sins. It will save you. It will make you free. It will make you a son of God. Come to Christ. He receives everyone who does. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you have given us, all that we have in Christ. We can uh, only barely appreciate it, but we are to spend our lives doing that and seeking to live for you in the great blessings that you have provided for us and the great abilities that we have through the new nature you've given us, a new heart, and the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us all who are believers in Christ. We thank you for that. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for all that we have in Christ. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. When Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, there was much joy and peace. Adam and Eve had fellowship with God Almighty. But one day, they gave in to temptation and sin entered their hearts. And from that moment on, everything changed. Pain, sorrow, and death came into our lives. The sin of man created a separation between man and God. And Adam and Eve were no longer welcome in the Garden of Eden, and they had to be removed. And they were. They could no longer be in the presence of the Holy God, and there was nothing that they could do to fix it. But God, in his infinite grace and mercy, did not send Adam and Eve away from the garden without hope. Before God removed his children from the garden, he made clothes to cover them. And he promised that one day a Savior would come and rescue them from their sin and from all the darkness and the sadness that they brought into their hearts. God promised that one day he himself would come back for them. And he did. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior that the Father promised to Adam and Eve. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, a divine person who possesses two natures. As a man, Jesus Christ is the perfect representative and substitute for mankind. And as God, he's able to satisfy the eternal wrath of God and gain our salvation and eternal life. Jesus Christ suffered and died in our place to pay the infinite debt that it is impossible for us to pray. So the Lord's Supper, which is where we're about to celebrate, is a memorial in which believers remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross once and for all for those who believe in him. This sacrament was instituted by the Lord Jesus the same night when he was betrayed 
In Matthew chapter 26, we read that while Jesus and his disciples were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The bread that Jesus gave to his disciples represents his body, which he gave for the remission of sins. And the wine represents his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of the sins of those who believe in him. So if you have placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we invite you to partake of the sacred supper with us. So let me give thanks for the bread. Our Father, we humbly come to you, acknowledging that we are sinners deserving of your wrath. We are eternally grateful for your infinite grace and mercy, and we thank you for sending your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by his death and resurrection paid for our sins and granted us eternal life. May you help us to confess our sins and daily remember that our salvation came at an infinite cost. We thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. John begins his gospel. John chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Then in verse 14 he wrote, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The disciples beheld his glory as the Son of God in many ways, in the power of his miracles, in the purity of his teaching, in the compassion of his character. But often in the Gospel of John, the word glory or the word glorified is used of the cross, which might seem kind of unusual, but it's used of the cross because there God's great glory was witnessed when both his justice and his love were displayed. God's perfect justice was satisfied in Christ's sacrifice when he punished our sins in him in our place. It is said that in the cross, justice and mercy kissed. That's the way forgiveness was obtained for us. And it is received by us through faith alone. That's the gospel. It is full of grace and truth because the Savior is full of grace and truth. Which is to say, this is the only way of salvation. This is the true way of salvation through the person work of Christ, and that's full of grace because it's a free gift for all who simply trust in Him. If you've done that, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to remember with us this uh, glorious, merciful sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for His people with this cup of wine. Now we'll remind you that in the center is grape juice. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for the sacrifice your son made and the opportunity that we have to remember him and remember what he did and how important that is for us to do that, lest we forget. So we thank you for this occasion, not because the cup has any value in and of itself to impart salvation to us. It is a remembrance of something we desperately need to remember continually, of what He sacrificed for us, who we are because of that. We thank You for Him. We thank You for His death for us. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Look forward to seeing you next week.